This episode is brought to you by Vonage. Your business needs more than an 800 number. With Vonage Voice API, you can provide the call experience your customers expect and get the data your team needs. From call analytics and virtual assistance to automatic speech recognition and text-to-speech in multiple languages. Your customer service team can help more people in more places. And with in-app voice, your customers can easily contact you the moment they have a question. Take your calls to the next level with Vonage Voice API. Learn more at Vonage.com. Hey everyone, Ray here. Here is your next great read. As FDR special envoy to Europe during World War II, Anna Rosenberg went where the president could not go. She was among the first Allied women to enter a liberated concentration camp and stood in the Eagle's Nest, Hitler's mountain retreat, days after it was captured. She guided the direction of the GI Bill of Rights and safeguarded the Manhattan Project. Her story has never been told until now. The Confidant, the untold story of the woman who helped win World War II and shape modern America, by historian Christopher Gorham, gives World War II students the full scope of Rosenberg's remarkable contributions. Emerging from modest immigrant beginnings, equipped with only a high school education, she was the real power behind national policies critical to America winning the war and prospering afterward. The Confidant, releasing just in time for Women's History Month, is available everywhere books are sold. Hello. And thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 405, Operation Pedestal, Slow Get You Killed. Last time, as the pedestal convoy passed Gibraltar, the enemy got to work. Rome knew something like this was coming, and thus prepared. But it was the German U-boat 73, under the command of Rosenbaum, that had sunk the carrier Eagle. The price for pedestal had just gotten expensive, perhaps too expensive, but it was underway and could not be undone. All involved could only hope the merchantmen and the tanker Ohio could safely reach Malta. But the trip wasn't finished yet. As the Carrier Eagle had gone down in the afternoon of August 11th, several destroyers were able to take on the survivors, picked up by other ships. The destroyers were larger and could accommodate better. With that done, Commander John Broom's flotilla of destroyers wrapped themselves around the carrier furious, more eager than ever to protect her. As covered last time, the carrier furious that same day had launched 38 Spitfires, which now flew on to Malta. The last fighter had lifted off at 3.12 p.m., but soon one of the Spitfires was having trouble with its recently exchanged propeller, and the pilot on board was a young man with not a lot of years under his belt. Search and rescue units were put on notice. Not sure how long the Spitfire would remain airborne, the pilot had been told to turn around. He was not going to make it to Malta, and the destroyer crews would rather not pull yet another pilot out of the sea. Fortunately, stressing the plane as little as possible with turns and changes to speed, the wounded Spitfire landed safely on Indomitable. Later that day, Malta reported that all 37 planes had landed safely. With that, Operation Bellows was over, and Furious turned around with her escorts to head west. Her part of pedestal was over. Well, not exactly. That night of August 11th, 12th, again there was no moonlight, the carrier and her five escorts sailed west. At 12.45 a.m., now August 12th, this smaller group of ships was on the port leg of a zigzag and currently doing 21 knots. At that moment, the Wolverine, with Lieutenant Commander P.W. Gretton at the helm, was told of a radar contact about 5,000 yards, bearing 265 degrees. Not wasting a moment, the Wolverine readied depth charges and one of her guns, but... Gretton held off on firing. He wanted to get in close before it was clear to the sub that the destroyer knew it was there. When the Wolverine was 800 yards away, the identification that it was a sub was confirmed. Not only that, but she was surfaced, which gave Gretton an idea 
on how to save ammunition. When 800 yards away, the commander called for full speed. The three boilers roared into life. Then he yelled, Crash stations! The crew braced themselves. The U-boat was hit at 26 knots, and contact was made near the rear of the conning tower. The sub rolled over, sank, and never resurfaced. The Wolverine and the Malcolm patrolled the area where the sub went down. Soon, two underwater explosions were heard, and as no one had dropped a depth charge, it must have been the enemy vessel giving up the ghost. Soon, oil rose to the surface, and the Wolverine was in its midst, not unlike a predator covered in its victim's blood. Only later would the Allies learn that the sub that had just been lost was the Italian sub Dagobur, captained by Tenete di Vascello. It had been going about 10 knots and had no idea of the destroyer's presence. There were no survivors, but on a crueler note, men from the Malcolm had heard voices in the water, but stopping to rescue them would not only have exposed that destroyer to a possible counterattack, but more importantly, it left the furious with one less protector. That was intolerable. The destroyers left the area. As for the Wolverine, she paid for her success. A steam pipe had been pierced, so the engine room had to be evacuated. With protection provided by other destroyers coming from Gibraltar, Wolverine would reach the rock safely by August 13th. Scott for Scott's here. You ever want to grow new grass faster? Kind of like when you press the two times playback button on your podcast so you can speed through episodes. Except it's Scott's turf builder, Rapid Grass. You're speeding your way from a thin and damaged lawn to a thicker, stronger one in just weeks. Bit too fast, maybe slow it down, okay? Let's just go back to normal speed. Get a bag of Scott's turf builder, Rapid Grass today. It grows grass two times faster than seed alone when applied at the new lawn rate, subject to proper care. Feed your lawn. Feed it. But staying with August 11th for a moment, the day that Eagle was sunk, This attack came just after Furious and her escorts had turned around and headed west. Fortunately, the Eagle was the only loss, though there had been a report by the Victorious of torpedo tracks crossing its bow. As for the Italian sub, you are sick, that had got this all going in the first place, she was still following the convoy, but at a safe distance. That is, safe for the sub, as Albacore aircraft overhead kept an eye on her. Besides losing the Eagle, there were portents of worse things to come. On that same day, at 2.20 p.m., radar picked up an incoming enemy formation. The defending fighters were led to them, but the Ju-88 flew very high, very fast, and did not deviate from that. Turns out, they were reconnaissance flights, and given their speed, they got away with whatever photos they had just taken. This incident caused Vice Admiral Seifert to write, The speed and height of the Ju-88s made the fleet fighter's task a hopeless one. It will be a happy day when the fleet is equipped with modern fighter aircraft. And as if Seifert had just jinxed them all, soon a wireless message came in that said, Enemy wireless signals intercepted. Message indicates that air attacks will be commenced against you at dusk. This was it. Seifert started calling out orders. First, the destroyers out in front were ordered to move further away to 6,000 yards. This would allow them to start shooting at enemy planes earlier than if they had stayed closer to the convoy. Who knew, maybe a few of the attackers could be taken out before they reached the convoy. At least that was the idea. Next, other destroyers were ordered to get closer to the tail end of the four merchant columns. From this position, the destroyers could produce an umbrella of four-inch shells, hopefully deterring any enemy planes from making a strafing bomb run down the line of one of these columns. This left the two remaining carriers to launch additional fighters. Soon, these planes were at 20,000 feet and ordered to vector north from where the threat was coming. What Cypher did not know, because a senior destroyer officer had only just found out, as the enemy planes were zooming in, that only 13 destroyers at this point had been refueled. 
One, did it have to be the number 13? Thank you very much. But also, this meant that that day's fighting could not last long. The destroyers were the workhorses of the convoy. Fuel should never be a consideration for them. But this time, it was. Fifteen minutes before sunset, the outer ring of destroyers lit up the sky with their AA fire. Soon, the bigger ships were joining in. The attackers were here. To the port or left side of the convoy, from some 8,000 feet, 30 Junkers Ju-88s started their bomb runs. However, from the same direction, just above the waves, was the real threat. That being 11 Heinkel 111 torpedo bombers. The idea was for the Junkers to distract while the torpedo bombers killed. But it was the torpedo bombers that were thrown off, not just by the flak, but by the sheer volume of it. Clearly, this was a level of defense the pilots were not used to. Still, some planes did manage to launch their torpedoes, but haphazardly, and these were dodged by all of the vessels. Seeing this, the Junkers, which had hoped to only be a decoy, now knew it was up to them. So many swung around whatever ship they were flying toward, and climbed up to find a weak spot. All the while, flak was exploding around these fast-moving planes. Suddenly, the wing leader, followed by another German aircraft, turned and made for the carrier victorious. Wisely, the carrier swung herself around to keep the two approaching planes in the last of the fading sunlight. And as they were lit up, every gun on victorious fired at the incoming planes, Both were splashed, but one managed to drop a bomb that came uncomfortably close. Meanwhile, more enterprising German pilots went after the fuel ships of Force R. Again, the planes were chased away, but as with the victorious, one bomb landed close to a tanker and a corvette. The results could have been much worse than just frayed nerves. And there was the rescue tug Jaunty, returning from her refueling. A Junkers went after her, but she had kept up her Erlikon gun enough to chase the would-be attacker away. Despite all this, the Axis planes would score a kill on this day, that being the walrus amphibious float plane in the hangar of the cruiser Manchester. Just as the air attacks were fading, the destroyer Quinton, commanded by Lieutenant Commander A.H.P. Noble in the forward screen, picked up an Aztec contact. Noble had his destroyer race ahead and drop several depth charges on four separate occasions. If a sub was damaged, no one could say for sure. Either way, just after 9 p.m., Noble moved his ship back into the convoy. One correspondent was aboard the Nigeria and witnessed that day's attacks and described it. In part, he said, tracers screaming across the sky in all directions, and overhead literally thousands of black puffs of bursting shells. The din was terrific, but through it all, you could hear the wail of the sirens for an emergency alteration, of course, to avoid torpedoes. Then a sudden cheer from a gun's crew as a Ju-88 goes spinning vertically downwards with both wings on fire. More cheers, and over to starboard, another Ju-88 was diving headlong for the sea. Against the sunset, you could see the parachutes of her crew as they drifted slowly downwards. And with that, the remaining planes turned to leave the area, heading to the northeast, back to Sicily. Once home, the German and Italian pilots claimed to have hit a carrier, a merchantman, and a cruiser, none of which was true. No, this had only been a raid, a probe, but it could have been a deadly one had the civilian ships not acted as one with their surface and air defenders doing the same. Again, no, this was only the opening act of this drama or tragedy. That had yet to be determined. Hey everyone, Ray here. If you want to own your own piece of World War II history, you should check out Investment Caster. This artist creates amazing models of tanks, planes, and landing craft out of pure silver. Each one is hand-casted and exquisitely finished to do justice to the genius engineering of World War II. And 
is 99.9% pure silver, making it an artifact and a treasure. Check out the current selection at investmentcaster.com and use promo code HISTORY for $10 off your first purchase. As the ship's gun crews had had their first real test, they were still on edge that evening. So when the fighters returned from having trying to run down the JU-88s, which had not gone very well, they were fired upon by their comrades below. Curses flew back and forth, but when all the guns stopped and the planes landed, only one fighter had been lost. Fortunately, the pilot was saved. August 11th had also been an eventful day on Malta. Parked on the airstrips, ready to go, were 15 Beauforts, a twin-engine torpedo bomber led by Wing Commander RPM Gibbs. On another field were 15 bow fighters, a heavy fighter variant of the Beaufort, led by Wing Commander Ross Shore. All these planes stayed ready throughout the day, should Italian surface forces be spotted on their way to harm pedestal. Besides these air units standing by, a few small raids were planned against parts of Sardinia and Sicily, specifically their airfields. Hopefully, this would force some Axis air forces to stay behind instead of hitting pedestal. The hardest hitting and significant raid carried out by Malta-based planes were those done by nine bow fighters of 248 Squadron, led by Wing Commander Pike. They hit two airfields in southern Sardinia, which forced the planes there to stay home. But it was what they saw on their way to the bombing that affected the wider operation. Below them, they had spotted three Italian subs, making for a position ahead of the convoy. What they did not see were the three other subs further out. The air raid against the Elmas airfield only resulted in one plane destroyed, but the British pilots had been up against heavy flak. As for the DC Momanu airfield, since there had been no advanced warning there, the attackers left behind four wrecked planes, two wrecked torpedoes, and 11 more damaged planes. But as good as this last raid probably felt, the pilots soon had something to report that would make everyone attached to pedestal stand too. Flying over Cagliari, the pilot spotted two light cruisers and two destroyers of Admiral Dazzara's 7th Cruiser Squadron. They had just left port. For the first time, the British brass had confirmation that the Italians were going to use their heavy surface ships. While never hoped for, the Admiralty needed to know what it was up against. Well, now they knew. And they knew this would affect Force X, the close escort force, on the last leg of the journey. But knowing was better than not knowing. A light Wellington bomber was sent to follow these Italian ships. It soon reported spotting an additional four cruisers and eight destroyers. Again, they may not go after the convoy now versus waiting for the larger escort to turn back before the Narrows were approached. But the air attacks that day were not the only diversions planned out by the Allies. Back on August 9th, the sub Una, commanded by Lieutenant D.S.R. Martin, had left Valletta Harbor and dropped off a small party of men on Sicily's east coast, near Catania. Their job was to raid nearby airfields and electrical stations. Coming ashore during the night of August 11th, 12th, The raiders did manage to destroy a power line, but the resulting explosion gave away their location. Before too long, all the raiders had been captured. When the Una returned to pick up the small unit, no one was there to meet the sub. This episode is brought to you by Circle. What is Circle? First of all, it's a beautiful shape. It's consistent inclusive, but it's also a place to build USDC, a digital dollar that's actually dollar-backed one-to-one. At Circle, they're building a future where money will travel at the speed of the internet for fractions of a penny. It's the place where crypto meets stability, where local businesses meet global customers, and the U.S. dollar meets USDC. Visit circle.com slash Spotify. 
The last hopeful diversion was two smaller convoys leaving Egypt that would then be combined and then sail on to Malta, supposedly. This was all under the command of Admiral Harwood. The two parts of the fake convoy, labeled MG3, sailed out of Port Syed and Haifa on the night of August 10th. They combined, headed north, but did not quite make the turn to go west, heading for Malta. This was more of a, hey, notice me. Alas, the German planes on Crete that this fake convoy was to have pinned down had already been moved, and the Italian ships they were trying to distract based in southwestern Greece stayed in port. So this entire enterprise had been a waste of time and fuel. Still, it had to be tried. Anything to increase the chances of pedestal getting through. As everyone on both sides knew, it would be the Narrows that offered up the greatest danger. There, the safe path was relatively narrow, hence shooting or bombing or even torpedoing a ship was relatively easier. But that premise was about to be challenged this very night from an unexpected source. A few months ago, the Harpoon convoy, well, what was left of it, had reached Malta. Between the daily air attacks and the lack of another large escort opportunity, the survivors of Harpoon were stuck in the Grand Harbor. But not now. With the Axis focused on pedestal, the two beat-up merchantmen, Orari and Troilus, along with their even more damaged destroyer escorts, Matchless and Badworth, made the attempt after waiting 54 days in Grand Harbor. They had gone through 289 air raids since they had been there. The four ships and their crews wanted to get the hell out. The freighter Arari was riding low in the water due to a flooded compartment on its port side and a purposefully flooded starboard side. The destroyer Matchless had a hole in her 10 feet by 7, but there was also a dent that was 36 feet by 19, and both destroyers were running low on ammo and fuel. Now, as all is fair in love and war, the four vessels had... Italian markings on them. Once they were past the Narrows, these would be removed. But any trick that could improve their odds of getting past Sicily, it would be taken. The ships of the former Harpoon convoy took off at 8.30 p.m. August 10th. Fortunately, they got off to a good start. Unfortunately, picked up Italian radio, mentioned having spotted several ships. Crap, this was it. And soon, the anxious men and women on Malta heard that German pilots were heading out to find and destroy those enemy ships. Which is when the radio mentioned the Germans were flying to the southeast of Malta, while the retreating battered ships were on their way west. Clearly, someone had made a mistake. By the night of August 11th, the four ships were almost through the Narrows, and the enemy was still focused on the vessels of Pedestal and the Phantom Fleet to the southeast of Malta. That day on the 11th, two planes spotted the ships heading through the Narrows, but they never indicated their loyalty one way or the other. There was no radio message, no wiggling of the wings, there was no attack. They simply turned and flew away. At 8.45 p.m., Matchless Commander, Lieutenant Commander Molem, spotted a darkened vessel in their path. Not wasting time, Molem sent up a star shell, which lit up the strange ship. It identified as a French minesweeper. But just before identifying itself, the star shell made the non-British vessel think it was under attack, so it shot off a few shells of its own. But soon, everyone's identities were known, and the shooting stopped. But that was not the end of the story. The French vessel was neither French nor a civilian ship. Rather, it was the Italian destroyer Malocello. But she had been busy at the time that the British ships came upon her. She was laying mines. But not just any mines. These were mines that would self-destruct after 72 hours. Why were they doing this? Because technically, this was Vichy water, 
and Rome did not need any more headaches, so they bent the rules as opposed to breaking them. Hopefully, these 72-hour mines would be enough to finish off Pedestal. To make matters worse, or better, depending on your point of view, there were actually two torpedo boats in the same area with the Malocello, also laying mines, but none of them were expecting an enemy vessel, so they chalked it up to confusion and got on with their work. The two damaged merchantmen and the weakened destroyers had no idea how lucky they had just been. Then again, perhaps the Malocello escaped a watery grave by not attacking the two destroyers, damaged though they were. It was a night of miracles and mercy. In time, the Germans would figure out that there had been no convoy to the southeast of Malta. There never was, which made them only more determined the next time they had a chance to stop any surface ships, and that chance was coming soon. As for these four Allied vessels, they safely reached Gibraltar on August 14th, with strange stories to tell everyone. 